One of the first videos I uploaded to my channel was about Chris Walk, who's known on social media as Chris Beat Cancer. I've actually uploaded about seven videos that are in some way related to Chris. For those of you who need catching up though, Chris had surgery for colon cancer in 2003, and he's since made a living promoting supposedly natural or alternative treatments for cancer, even though his own cancer was cured by conventional medicine. Naturally, Chris delves into all kinds of health-related conspiracies, but he hasn't really said much about COVID-19 on Facebook or YouTube. And that's probably because these platforms have been surprisingly effective at removing misinformation related to the pandemic. But Chris has been talking about the pandemic to his Square One subscribers on Vimeo. So let's see what kind of information he's providing to his paying audience. Here we go. I'm not going to get the vaccine because I do not participate in drug trials. That's why. That's my personal number one reason. I don't do drug trials. I don't take experimental drugs. It doesn't matter how much coercion uh, is forced upon me. I'm not going to take an experimental drug. Uh, so number two, I'm not at risk. Number three, uh, the coronavirus is uh, n much less deadly than they want you to believe. It's not like Ebola where like, you know, 10% of the people who get it die or whatever. Uh, so if you just look at the CDC, you'll see the survival is 99.997%. Okay, so we'll take these points in order. First of all, the COVID-19 vaccines are not experimental in either the scientific sense or the regulatory sense, which are the two most important considerations. You won't be a participant in a drug trial if you take a vaccine as part of the national rollouts in the UK, the US, or around the world. You're not going to be followed or monitored as part of a scientific experiment, so on that point Chris is simply wrong. Now Chris might still feel that the vaccines are experimental in some way that's important to him, and he's perfectly entitled to his non-expert opinion on what the word experimental means. But his reasoning here about drug trials is wrong, and honestly it's a strangely selfish position to take. Chris clearly thinks that drugs should be tested, but only on other people. Chris's second point is that he's not at risk, and Chris probably is in a lower risk group, but he is a cancer survivor, and I'm pretty sure he's over 40, so he's certainly not in the lowest risk group, and no one is completely without risk. But this rather misses one of the reasons for giving the vaccine to low risk groups, which is reducing transmission to people who are in the high risk groups. Chris's third reason is that the virus is much less deadly than they want you to believe. But what do they want us to believe. Well, I read mostly scientific literature and articles from the mainstream media, which I guess means I'm just guzzling down blue pills. And most articles I've read from the BBC or similar include statements like, don't forget the overwhelming majority of people do recover from COVID and it's often a mild disease. That's from an article titled, COVID, How Worried Should We Be? It seems that estimates of the infection fatality rate have settled around the half percent mark when considering all age groups, but obviously that calculation is very sensitive to demographics. But what about Chris Walk's 99.997% survival rate? Well, it doesn't come from the CDC. Chris is quoting a viral tweet from a blogger, and he's not even fully quoting the false information in that tweet. 99.997% was supposedly the survival rate for under 19s. If I had to guess, I suppose the conservative Latina probably did a few calculations of her own to come up with these numbers, but they're not from the CDC. As you can see though, she's actually quoted a rather alarming 5% infection fatality rate for the over 70s, which to my mind pretty conclusively answers her question on why people are pushing the vaccines. But let's be real, I wouldn't be making this video if that's all Chris had to say. So far it's all been pretty predictable, so let's move on to the real silliness. The other, the other big reason uh, not to get it is there's a fantastic drug that has, is 91% effective. It's called Ivermectin. And uh, Ivermectin is incredible. Uh, they're using it around the world. The media won't talk about it. Uh, the, the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, they're all ignoring it. But there's amazing, brilliant, caring doctors all over the world treating patients and with ivermectin and their patients aren't dying. It's great. They're taking it proactively as a preventative and not getting COVID. And they're uh, prescribing it when patients are diagnosed and seeing incredible turnaround in health, people getting well. And ivermectin is one of the safest pharmaceuticals in the world. It's one of the only pharmaceuticals that I will actually recommend. You'll ever hear me recommend. So 
anyway, that's the shortest possible answer I can give on the vaccine. The reality is it, you don't need it. Ivermectin works. So um, Ivermectin, unfortunately, is uh, very cheap. It's inexpensive. And uh, n drug companies are not interested. <laughs> they don't want to sell you a cheap generic drug. They want to sell you a brand new vaccine. So apparently Chris doesn't want to take the COVID-19 vaccine because he believes that ivermectin is a superlatively effective treatment for COVID-19 and can even stop you from catching him. Now the first thing that Chris said here is that ivermectin is 91% effective. And before we go any further, I just wish people would stop doing this. 91% effective at what? Preventing you from catching the disease? Preventing you from dying from the disease? A percentage like that without context is less than useless. It's simply confusing. But let's talk about ivermectin. It's something that's become enormously polarized. On the one hand, you have the regulators and the authorities like the FDA and the World Health Organization telling us that ivermectin probably doesn't work. By the way, they're not ignoring ivermectin. They've seen the evidence and put out statements. They just haven't found the data compelling. Perhaps surprisingly, even the manufacturer of ivermectin isn't promoting it as a cure or treatment for COVID-19. Now, on the other side, you have some doctors, scientists, and national governments who are strongly advocating for the use of ivermectin. Everyone has access to the same information here. So why are people reaching different conclusions? Well, let's put aside the Chris Walk narrative of some kind of sinister plot to sell expensive vaccines over effective treatments. That's going to fit nicely in the dumpster fire with his other stupid opinions, because we know that low-cost drugs have been repurposed with great effect. The cheap steroid dexamethasone was shown to be effective and has been widely incorporated into treatment regimes. So what's the evidence for ivermectin? Well, I think everyone sensible agrees that the way we should evaluate whether ivermectin works or not is through clinical trials. But there's amazing, brilliant, caring doctors all over the world treating patients and with ivermectin and their patients aren't dying. It's great. They're taking it proactively as a preventative and not getting COVID, and they're prescribing it when patients are diagnosed and seeing incredible turnaround in health, people getting well. No, Chris, that's an anecdote. It's not going to help us here. And Chris should be the first to recognize the issue in this kind of story. As he himself knows, most people who catch COVID will get better. So these reports of patients improving after taking ivermectin are unremarkable because most people get better anyway. But let's get back to the data that matters. So there have been a number of trials that have reported positive results. And there have also been a number of trials that have reported negative results. So what can we do here when there's a mixture of results like this and the picture still isn't clear? Well, the next step is to collect all these trials together and try and synthesize the evidence. We can search for all the relevant data by conducting a systematic review of the literature, and we can combine the results of trials with a technique called meta-analysis. The most comprehensive meta-analysis that I've seen is this one titled Ivermectin for Prevention and Treatment of COVID-19, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. It's a preprint, which means it's a scientific paper written by scientists, but it hasn't been peer-reviewed yet. And the authors have done a great job of tracking down a ton of data here, but most of the included studies have also, themselves, never been peer-reviewed. A lot of the data here has come from preprint servers, and sometimes the data has been obtained by just emailing authors. Now, getting data from unpublished manuscripts isn't new. It's actually essential to consider all sources of data during a systematic review. But for the majority of included trials to be unpublished, well, that's kind of unusual. And I would encourage you to read these preprint trial reports yourself. You don't have to be a scientist to see that the reporting of this data on ivermectin is not always at the highest standard. Sometimes the English is just quite bad. So here's what's happening, at least in my view. Some people have seen these positive results from clinical trials and meta-analysis, and that's satisfied them, and they can't understand how anyone can see the data and not be swayed. Meanwhile, there are a significant number of people who've seen those same trials and meta-analyses, but they're not confident that the numbers are accurate. And it's not just a question of the direction of the treatment effect, but also the quality of the data. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed how research is reported. There's an urgent need for effective treatments. No one wants to wait for peer reviews to share their important result. But it's not clear how confident we should be in non-peer-reviewed systematic reviews of mostly non-peer-reviewed trials. Surely even the ivermectin enthusiasts can understand this difficulty. The best way to resolve this would be with large, high-quality, well-designed trials that are pre-registered. But before we get to those kind of trials, there has to be a compelling reason to actually run them. As you might have guessed by now, I'm a doubter. I've looked at a few of these positive trial reports, 
and they look kind of dubious. If you want me to talk about why I think that, we'll have to be in another video. And here's where I'm going to get to the bottom line of this huge ivermectin tangent. Whilst the benefit from ivermectin is uncertain and the risk is also unclear, we do know that the vaccines work. They're safe and effective. The trials were much larger and the results have been scrutinized by peer review. It's simply nonsensical to turn down the vaccine because you think ivermectin is effective. But anyway, here's where we get to the most absurd part of Chris's square one session. Chris says you can get ivermectin by doing an online consultation with a doctor, but that's not the only place where you can find it. It's, it's incredibly easy to get. Anyone can get it. And you can also get it at Tractor Supply because uh, they sell it there for horses. So um, there are some people, if you're, it's an emergency and you need it fast, you can buy it at uh, feed stores and Tractor Supply, places like that. It's horse parasite medicine. It's the same stuff. It comes in a liquid form. And on the COVID-19 website, it, it tells you exactly how much dose to take for your body weight. You didn't hear that from me. Okay, next question. Remember at the start of this video where Chris firmly insisted that no amount of coercion could force him to join a drug trial that isn't actually a drug trial, but here he is telling his subscribers to go out and buy veterinary medicines. And I want to be really clear on this. It's not the same stuff. You should not take medicines intended for animals ever. And Chris knows he's saying something that he shouldn't say here. Animal medicines have different formulations, they aren't regulated in the same way, and they don't have the same kind of quality control in place for human medicines. And they may contain ingredients that have never been tested for safety in humans. What really concerns me here is that Chris Walk subscribers are often vulnerable. I know because I interact with a lot of them on social media, and frankly, some of them just aren't all there. There's a real chance that they will act on this advice and harm themselves. But this is nothing new for Chris Walk. He's been giving out stupid and harmful medical advice for years. Well, that's it for this video. I went off on an absolute tangent on ivermectin, but I'm sure some of you are still going to be raving about it in the comments. Some people have asked where I've been and what I've been up to. Well, I've been at work. I do have a full-time job and it keeps me busy. I've been writing a paper and I've been writing a lot of comments on PubPeer. I might talk about those things in a future video. I've also been working on a lot of different scripts for videos that I've never quite finished because I wasn't really happy with them. I don't want to make mediocre videos but perhaps I've been a little bit too judgmental of my own efforts recently. I've been tempted to make some videos that aren't so closely related to science, but I'm not really sure how people would feel about me changing the subject of some of my videos. So that's the update on me in far more detail than anyone ever wanted. If you're still watching at this point, you should probably subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like the video and leave a comment. That's how we can improve the search ranking of these videos. And if you're into social media and that kind of thing, I do have a Twitter and Facebook. I should try and post more often.